So for the next talk, I'm very pleased to introduce my good friend and colleague, Dr. Michael Coe. He has uh, been doing work in ethnobiology uh, through the uh, University of Hawaii, Department of Botany, where I got my master's many years ago, shortly after the Earth's crust cooled. So I have great fondness for that place. And uh, he came there a few years ago and did a PhD, did a master's first, I believe, and then his PhD investigating these keystone species uh, in the Amazon. And uh, that with a lot of focus on uh, ayahuasca. So he's uh, an affiliate uh, consultant for the McKenna Academy, and we're trying to uh, initiate an ethnobiology consortium to encourage academics, academia, to take another look at uh, ethnobiology-related sciences because it's being cut in many, in many contexts uh, in academics. Sadly, uh, at the University of Hawaii, which is one of the places where you would think uh, ethnobiology would have a high priority after Michael completed his PhD there, they <laughs> decided to cut the program. It's probably my fault. Uh, not, it was not his fault. <laughs> he did a wonderful job, but actually his supervisor there then moved to another institution and, you know, always looking for opportunities to cut budgets and reduce what they offer students, they decided to discontinue it. And that's unfortunate because it's unfortunate in itself, but especially because Hawaii, of all places, is an area where traditional medicine is still very important among the people. It's high biodiversity. If any place should be investigating ethnobiology, it's the University of Hawaii. But they're not doing it, but we hope to uh, you know, perhaps change that in the future. In the meantime, Dr. Ko is one of the best examples of what can happen when you combine serious field work with, tradi with traditional uh, ethnobotany with the current approaches to, uh, to ethnobiological science. They often say ethnobotany is not science. Ethnobiology is not science. I think Michael's work will illustrate that that's just not true. So Michael, without further ado, Thank you, very happy to have you with us Thank this you. morning. Thank you. Sorry, I just have a couple of housekeeping agreement reminders. <laughs> um, a literal note from our amazing tech team Stay off the Wi-Fi or we're going to cut it off <laughs> or turn it off. <laughs> um, only use the front door. So, so again, this is the entrance and the exit. The back door is for the tech team. We're going to be doing interviews later. So please only use the front, the front, and, uh, the front door for the entrance and the exit. And there is a, um, a pile of wood, firewood, on the right-hand side or your left-hand side. We're going to be moving that out of, out of the way during lunchtime so there will be uh, uh, more ease to pass through there. Okay, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Christina. <laughs> All right, thank you guys at ESPDPT5. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Christina. Uh, this is my talk on Interco Projection Models, a roadmap for sustainable ayahuasca production. First, I want to thank the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy, uh, Annette, Christina, Dennis, for all your behind the scenes work. All the key players here that have made this possible, this event will go down in history as legendary. And I'm honored to be here. Uh, thanks for the wonderful staff at St. Giles here, the incredible hosts. Uh, it's an incredible honor to be here, so thank you guys so much. I'm also incredibly thankful to all my colleagues and mentors that have supported me through this field work and have imparted their knowledge and wisdom to enable me to be here where I'm at today. So thank you. All right, so as we begin, um, as Dennis was saying, ethnobiology is a, method, a discipline of diverse methodologies. And I think one of the greatest advantages and challenges of ethnobiological research is the diversity of methods available to understand the interactions between human societies and the natural world. Take, for example, legendary ethnobiologist, explorer, and Harvard professor Richard Evan Schultes who is known among many of us here today for his incredible journeys throughout the Northwest Amazon, where he documented the use of sacred and medicinal plants among indigenous peoples like the Kofan, the Makuna, the Kamsa, 
the Yakuna, the Engano, and Watoto. Now, in following in the footsteps of his childhood hero, Richard Spruce, while traveling some half a million square miles across the Northwest Amazon, from Bogota to the Sibuente Valley, to the cloud-soaked forests of the Andes, and the sacred headwaters of the Putumayo River, Schultes' methodological accomplishments were both remarkable and captivating. Beyond the insurmountable botanical collections he made, many of which were single-handedly responsible for advancing our scientific understanding of the biological diversity in the Amazon that had long been useful to indigenous peoples for subsistence, healing, divination, and connecting with the ancestors, Schultes was arguably the first ethnobiologist to use participant observation, a method commonly used now in ethnobiology to gain a glimpse into the emic perspective or worldview of a culture studied along with their ethnopharmacology during ethnobiological research. Now, in using this methodology, Schultes lived with indigenous Amazonian communities. He tasted the bitter leaves of plants they used for healing and participated in daily subsistence activities that allowed him to gain an in-depth understanding of their unique and diverse ways of being, ways of knowing, and ways of relating to the natural world that were far different than his own. And beyond this, Schultes accelerated the development of what is known as utilitarian ethnobotany, a subdiscipline of ethno ethnobiology that is primarily focused on documenting medicinal plants and their uses with practical implications for drug discovery. And thankfully for much of Schulte's work, which he so beautifully articulated in some 400 publications throughout his lifetime, provides us a glimpse into the remnants of an ancestral past, a past of plant use among indigenous peoples of the Northwest Amazon that lay in the wake of the Spanish conquest. Now, since Schultes' time, ethnobiology as a discipline has grown to include numerous subdisciplines, each with their own approaches to investigate the interactions between people, organisms, and culture, some of which are highlighted here. Now, it's important to understand that to highlight this interdisciplinary methods in ethnobiology, most ethnobiologists to date are either trained biologists that are comfortable in conducting interviews and asking questions about plants, animals, or environmental use, or they are trained social scientists that are interested in about identifying, cataloging, or learning about plants and animal species. And given such a multifaceted set of backgrounds, ethnobiologists today are stemming from a range of expertise from anthropology, pharmacology, um, sociology, archaeology, to linguistics and other related fields. And given such a sheer methodological complexity involved, ethnobiologists today have been exposed to a wide variety of analytical methods of inquiry that combine the intuitions, the skills, the methods, and biases from researchers in all of these areas. And because of this methodological complexity, academics have criticized ethnobiology or its subdiscipline ethnobotany for, for lacking a consistent methodological rigor. And while this may be considered a limit or a challenge as the discipline continues to evolve, it's hardly a limitation and will indeed prove to be the contrary. In fact, it is highly probable that diverse methodologies are absolutely necessary to understand the complexity surrounding some of the world's current biocultural crises. And to illustrate this, I invite each of us here today at ESPD 55, all of us from our range of expertise and backgrounds, to consider how we might apply our efforts collectively to use them to ensure that we provide practical solutions to address the current social and cultural challenges that currently threaten the stability of social and ecological systems while simultaneously addressing the needs of indigenous peoples and local communities. This is critically important, now more so than ever. Let's face it, we're now living in a world where providing practical solutions to address environmental and cultural challenges that threaten the current stability of social and ecological systems are going to require creative and collaborative efforts that transcend the boundaries of academic disciplines. 
of individuality, of colonial epistemologies embedded within research, social inequalities, and notions of academic superiority. To put it bluntly, we all need to work together. And perhaps in this context, ethnobi ethnobiology as a discipline of diverse methodologies provides us an essential platform where we can unite our expertise and knowledge to inspire change. I think each of us here in this room at ESPD5, we possess the knowledge and essential skills that may hold the keys to a sustainable future. And this is why ESPD55 is such a legendary and important event that I'm deeply honored to be a part of. For within, the, for within this space, we have some of the most brilliant minds and creative thinkers and supporters near and far uniting for a common goal, to plant the seeds that inspire change. And this is exactly the necessary catalyst needed to facilitate the development of collaborative partnerships and aimed at providing creative solutions to re required to address current biocultural conservation challenges. Now, while many of us are long been aware of the plight of indigenous peoples of the Amazon basin, including the devastating forces at work that pose undeniable threats to the biological and cultural webs of life that are responsible for the persistence of much of the cultural, the chemical, and the linguistic and biological diversity of the planet, it's clear that we have so much and so far to go. You know, one of the most important challenges that we face today, you know, a current biocultural conservation challenge and sustainability concern of the Amazon basin that has yet to thoroughly captivate our widespread attention and urgently needs our collective efforts to address is the increased exploitation of ayahuasca, specifically its source plants, Benesteriopsis capi and Psychotria viridis for ayahuasca and Dibleteris cabarana for yahe. Now, we've only begun to witness the effects of increased harvest pressures of ayahuasca source plants, where Banisteriopsis capi shortages have been reported in and around major cities like Pucalpa and Iquitos, where ayahuasca production has grown exponentially over the last decade to provide the brew to an estimated 100 to 200 centers in the area, in addition to the exportation of the concentrated brew to various ayahuasca communities and practitioners around the world. And to date, it is unclear how many ayahuasca source plants remain in the wild. And we can only estimate how many tons of biomass from these plants are harvested annually to meet exponentially growing supply and demand chains. And although there have been considerable efforts towards sustainability, where growers and harvesters, syncretic religious organizations like the Union de Vegetal and the Santo Daime have planted more ayahuasca source plants in and around the Amazon basin. It is unclear whether or not these efforts will be enough to provide ayahuasca for the foreseeable future. With, now, while increased harvest pressure and intensity does not always result in a decline of culturally important plants, like ayahuasca source plants, it is clear that these plants may become overexploited while ayahuasca production continues and becomes globalized, and this brew becomes commercialized. Therefore, it is essential that we evaluate sustainability concerns. And in moving forward, it's really important to ask ourselves collectively, what do we know about ayahuasca sustainability? It is clear that much time and focus has been spent by social and natural scientists studying ayahuasca from both pharmacological and social cultural perspectives. Incredible advancements have been made in studying the brew's chemistry and pharmacology we now have evidence to support that ayahuasca consumption can enhance creativity, it can reduce anxiety, it can exhibit antidepressant and anti-addictive effects, improve psychological well-being and quality of life. And more recently, there's evidence to suggest that ayahuasca consumption can facilitate the formation of new neurons, all of which indicate that ayahuasca acts on multiple levels of neural complexity. And this also points to the great therapeutic potential of ayahuasca in contemporary medicine and traditional medicine. And we know that the use of ayahuasca is deeply rooted in the social organization and worldviews of numerous cultural communities and practitioners throughout the Amazon basin. And there's no doubt that many lineages of vegetalistas, maestros, maestras, pais, taitas, 
Padrinos and other religious and shamanic practitioners are experts in navigating the inner domains of consciousness, the inner paths to outer space, and the realms of the spirits invoked by the ayahuasca-induced experience. <laughs> but there remains significant knowledge gaps on how ayahuasca responds from an ecological perspective, and we have yet to thoroughly develop collaborative partnerships, synergistic efforts worldwide, a global ayahuasca project focused on sustainability so that ayahuasca will remain for future generations. Now, many of us here today that have consistently taken this medicine, whether for personal or spiritual growth, rites of passage, religious beliefs, healing and diagnosing of illness, we hold a deep appreciation for ayahuasca. And those of us that have embraced the wisdom of the teacher plants, if we listen, we now have a responsibility of reciprocity, a responsibility to support sustainable ayahuasca harvest and production. We must not let this precious opportunity to respectfully learn how to manage ayahuasca production slip through our fingertips. There is much more at stake beyond revenue streams of commercialization and subsistence of local livelihoods. These are entire ways of being at stake. Therefore, we must honor the wisdom of the ages and learn from the symbiotic relationships of the natural world to ensure that the diversity of ways of being and ways of knowing inspired by ayahuasca remain and continue their dialogue with humanity in reverence. In doing so, we must learn more about the ecology and the demography of these plants and how they're responding to increasing harvest pressures over time. This is a necessary step towards sustainable ayahuasca production. In addition, it is essential that we thoroughly understand and value the knowledge of indigenous peoples and local communities and how they are actively managing ayahuasca source plants. This will incredibly inform collaborative efforts towards sustainable production, and ways in which one can inform the other from science and from the local knowledge. Now, what I will introduce all of us here today is integral projection models, IPMs hereafter. Now, IPMs are a more contemporary quantitative technique in ethnobiology or its subdiscipline ethnoecology that may hold keys to understanding how we can develop a sustainable future for ayahuasca production. Now, I, IPMs are time discrete demographic models that ultimately have been developed in population ecology over the last several decades and have gained momentum for the ability to project the population dynamics of a given species in response to various anthropogenic and environmental factors such as climate change and harvesting intensities. Now, in this context, IPMs describe how a given population structured by individual state variable or a continuous trait changes in discrete time. And this is one of the advantages of IPMs compared to other population models because they avoid any biological consumptions linked to artificial synthetic divisions of life stages across the ontogeny or life history of a given species. Now I've more recently applied this population model to my own ethnobiological research, which has proven useful in developing a preliminary understanding of how several ayahuasca populations may be doing ecologically from a conservation standpoint. And although I will primarily focus on Benesteriopsis capi ayahuasca for this talk, the same methodology can be applied to other teacher plants, such as Psychotria viridis, the other source plant for ayahuasca, and Dibleteras cabarana, the other source plant for yahe. Now, in this context, IPMs are a powerful tool because it allows us to quantify measures of growth survival, and reproduction across the life history of ayahuasca to make robust predictions on population level patterns that allow us to have a mechanistic understanding of how these populations are responding to harvest from an ecological standpoint. So for those of us less familiar with ayahuasca, ayahuasca or Banisteriopsis capi from a botanical perspective is a Malpighiaceae liana. It's botanically described as a liana with brown bark with dark green ovate to lanceolate leaves about seven inches in length, two to three inches wide. The inflorescences are axillary with many five petaled flowers that are pink to rose colored. The fruit produced is a 
samuroid shizzle carp consisting of about two to three samaras connected at a torus. Flowering generally occurs between December and August with samara production between March and August in tropical systems. It can also reproduce asexually or clonally where new ramets are formed to take, um, take root either when um, ayahuasca is cut or when host trees are fell or also due to outplanting of cut stems. Now, to encourage a deeper understanding of IPMs, I will first break them down mathematically while highlighting some of the basic statistics used to build them. I'll also provide examples from our data collection on our demographic study to help facilitate reproducibility and a practical application of IPMs for ayahuasca. So when we examine an IPM mathematically, IPM essentially is composed of several size-dependent functions that estimate the ultimate growth, survival, and fertility of a given population over time. So on the left-hand side of the equation, we have what is known as the current population state. Is it composed of n, the number of individuals in a population, y is their size, and t plus 1 is a time interval into the future. Now on the right-hand side of the equation, we have known as what is the kernel. And the kernel is the core of the IPM composed of several size-dependent functions that describe how the current size of an individual at an initial time dictates its size and that of its offspring size in the future. So essentially, the kernel describes how a current size distribution of individuals in the population changes over one time step. Now, to project the expected population state, the kernel is multiplied by the current population state composed of the number of individuals of a given size x, and t is the current time interval at the initial census period. So, for further clarification, we can break down the kernel mathematically to expand it to include a survival, growth, and fertility function that I will go into more detail here shortly. But for those of us less mathematically inclined, we can look at the integral projection model as a means to estimate the size that individual plants are in a population tomorrow are a function of the size that they are today, how much they grow, and how much they reproduce. So in looking at our survival growth function, essentially the survival growth function estimates the probability that each individual in a population will survive and grow given that it survives the year prior. For the fertility function, this estimates the reproductive capacity of each individual in the population and it's composed of several variables under the understanding that in order to reproduce, each individual has to survive. It also consists of the probability of fruiting, the number of fruits produced, the probability of germination and establishment, and the size class distribution of new offspring in the population. Now it's important to mention here that IPMs are extremely flexible and that they can incorporate a wide range of life histories into the functions. For example, for ayahuasca, since we know that it reproduces clonally as well, we can expand and partition the fertility kernel in order to include clonality, which will apply this to ayahuasca. So to build our IPM for practical applications, we, entire, we imply this entire population model over the life history of ayahuasca. And for our example, we'll use several ayahuasca populations where data uh, gather from censusing their vital rates, which include growth, survival, and fertility, or ultimately estimated from one year to the next, which is our, our time interval. And as a reminder, when we, do our, when we conduct our IPM, the entire life cycle of liana is, char is characterized as a function of size as a continuous trait. Now, data on our vital rates are then used to build regression models that are used for a backbone of our IPM. And when we conduct our regression models, we'll also include the level of harvest intensity as an abiotic covariate to explain the variation in vital rates beyond the effect of size. And this will inform us on how we can look at how harvesting is affecting a given population of ayahuasca. So to illustrate this, 
I will highlight field work conducted over several years by myself along with a team of invaluable colleagues consisting of friends from a local Shipibo community in the department of Loreto, volunteers and colleagues at a local Shipibo-led NGO, Alianza Arcana, and anthropologist Laura Dev, who is now an assistant professor of land stewardship at the University of Wisconsin. Now, I'm deeply embedded to all of my colleagues who have shared their time and invaluable knowledge and who have supported my field work throughout the years. This was not an easy task and was a worthy challenge to endure for any sane person, especially the relentless bombardment of mosquitoes. <laughs> now, after censusing ayahuasca populations, you know, several weeks out of each year over the time interval, I've gained an appreciation for an imagined reality of being in the Amazon for 10 hours a day and not getting swarmed by bloodthirsty insects. In fact, one of our greatest allies during this process was mapacho, you know, Amazonian tobacco that when smoked and blown around you, somehow momentarily kept them at bay. The only challenge was not to puff on the mapacho too hard because it is fairly psychoactive. And when you're collecting important data, it's always good to have someone home in the rational mind. So, uh, together, we conducted my, the first, to my knowledge, demographic study on ayahuasca from 2017 and 2018 in a remote the region of Loreto, Peru, that has more recently become a central location for ayahuasca harvest that currently supplies the ayahuasca vine to cities like Uquito, San Pugalpa, and surrounding areas. Now, to give a background on the climate, it's a tropical rainforest climate with a mean annual temperature about 27 degrees Celsius and annual rainfall about 1,600 millimeters. <coughs> Now, in doing so, we, we set up six four-hectare plots and census two ayahuasca populations consisting of about 300 individual plants in total, experiencing differing levels of harvest intensity over a two-year period. Now, in the differencing and in harvest intensity was defined between the populations based on two categories, the accessibility of harvesters to the site and the number of vines harvested noted during the census interval. So, for example, we had three plots classified as one ayahuasca population that was less, successful, less accessible to harvesters and experienced less harvest pressure as our treatment one, which you guys will want to remember this later. And we had a population that consisted of three plots that were um, easily accessible to harvesters and experienced greater harvest pressure that we classified as treatment two. So at the beginning of our census period, we noted 41 harvested vines in between the populations. Uh, and at the end of our census interval, we noted 28 harvested vines, which led to a reduction in 31% um, between our treatments, which was quite interesting. Uh, initially, we had a difference of nine harvested vines at our initial time T and four harvested vines between our treatment at T plus one. But we collected data for each individual vine to estimate their viral rates, again, consisting of growth survival and fertility from one year to the next. And we measured size for each mature ayahuasca vine at diameter at breast height and basal diameter for seedlings and clonal ramets. In our study, clonal ramets were defined as functionally independent ramets that were not connected to a mother, and seedlings were characteristic and upright without branching. Mothers were defined as closest mature individuals to seedlings or clones. Each point of measurement was marked and tagged so that we can measure the ayahuasca vine in the same place from one year to the next. GPS coordinates were also taken for each individual vine to ensure that we can relocate and re-monitor the population. Now, in the case that individual ayahuasca vines were harvested, we used the GPS coordinates to relocate the vines to ensure that we could um, note that during the census period. Now, these data we then used to build our regression analysis for our backbone of our IPM where survival growth consisted of, were estimated in two parts. For survival, we modeled the probability that each ayahuasca liana will grow and survive to the expected population state under the condition that it survived the year prior. And this was done by modeling the probability of survival as a logistic regression following a binomial air structure. For growth, we modeled the probability that each ayahuasca vine will grow. <laughs> uh, uh, under the condition that it survived the year prior, and it grew to a, a specific size. And this was done by modeling growth as a linear regression following a log normal distribution due to the spread of our observations. And because of this, we also include size-dependent variance in our models. 
And our linear regression described the expected size of the individuals during the census interval and our log normal distribution accounted for the range of possible sizes and our variance during the interval. Forgive me here, there's a lot of, a lot of math. <laughs> so for our fertility function, as I noted, because it's flexible, we expanded it to include clonality. So you'll see Fy of x here that accounts for sexually reproducing individuals and Cy of x that accounts for clonally reproducing individuals. And for fertility for all cases, it was estimated under the probability that each individual survived to be able to reproduce. We modeled this following a, log, um, a logistic regression using a binomial error structure. And the same for the probability of fruiting and the probability of clonality. Now, for the number of clones produced, this was count data. Um, so therefore, we modeled it using a general linearized model following a Poisson error structure. And we did not have the direct number for the average number of fruits produced uh, during, by reproductive individuals. This was one of the most challenging data collections that we had during our census period. We had two climbers that climbed host trees and other trees near the ayahuasca vines. It was extremely challenging. We could locate flowers, but to get an actual accurate measure of Samara production was nearly impossible for them. In fact, one of my climbers got stung by a scorpion and it was a threat to his life. So immediately we stopped our senses for that day and took him back to the village to seek medical attention. And so because of this, we used knowledge from the known reproductive ecology on Benestriopsis muricata, where it was known that fruit production on average would produce about 71 fruits, uh, yielding about 219 samaras on average per reproductive individuals. So we estimated this as size independent fruit production for reproductive individuals in a population we then developed a conservative scenario where we vary the slope in our regression models for the increased harvested site. We had a slope of 0.1. Decreased harvested sites, we had a slope of 0.6. Now, the probability of germination and establishment were both constants. And we were able to model this based on the number of seedlings produced and the ultimate uh, conservative estimates based on the fruiting ratio. And the size class distribution of new offspring were also measured directly, but we modeled them following a Gaussian distribution. Now, when we look at the results of some of our regression models, we see that there is a strong relationship between the size of the individuals at the initial time and the, and, and the growth initial of the individuals at our T plus one. We also see that harvesting did not have a significant effect on growth, so which is good. Um, when we look at our survival probability, survival, ultimately, the larger the survival, uh, the larger the Liana size classes were, the greater probability of survival. However, we did see that harvest did have a significant negative effect on the overall probability of survival. This was size dependent. As we see in the population experiencing a greater harvest intensity with the red uh, regression line, we can see that individuals of about 2.9 millimeters log scale and above uh, experienced greater mortality rates. And there were also a higher number of smaller size classes that survived the population compared to the lower harvested or less harvested population in terms of harvest pressure. So for a, such a long lived species, life history theory would suggest that survival of large size class individuals would drive the population dynamics over the long term. And we can see here that harvesting of larger size classes would ultimately suggest that there's a possibility of a reduct, reduction in overall population growth rate. And we'll see this between the sites as we move forward um, in looking at our IPM. Now, looking at some of the regression models for probability of fruiting and clonality, we see that harvesting did not have a significant effect on either. Uh, these probabilities were size dependent. So individuals of about 3.5 millimeters log scale and above had a greater probability of fruiting and clonal reproduction, which also indicates that these were the reproductive size classes. So we then used these regression models for our survival growth and fertility functions and combined them according to the life history of ayahuasca to build the kernel from our IPM. And we use this following this main equation. Now the kernel is then used to project the size distribution of the population 
in time. And to do so, we had to specify the limits of integration. And this will discretize the kernel to generate a large population matrix where the boundary between matrix elements is ultimately the range of sizes of the individuals in the population. Now from there, we use basic matrix and uh, algebra where we, can, um, where we can produce the eigenvalues, the eigenvectors, and for further elasticity analysis. Now, for the eigenvalues, the important knowledge here is that we have what is known as lambda. And lambda is our long-term long population growth rate. We also have our largest subdiamond eigenvalue, which is lambda 1, which is our short-term population growth rate. And when we look, for example, in our population, we can see that, for example, if lambda is greater than 1, then we know a population is expected to increase over time. If lambda is equal than 1, we know the population is expected to be at stability and equilibrium. And if a population is less than 1 for lambda, then we know it is expected to decline. Now, when actually applying this to our treatments, where we have the um, ayahuasca population experiencing less harvest pressure, we can see that the lambda is greater than 1 and is expected to increase by 3.2% per year over the long term whereas our population experiencing less harvest pressure is actually in decline with a lambda less than 1 and is expected to decrease by 1.3% per year. Now, while these long-term projections are informative, it's also important to consider these short-term uh, population growth rates because when we look at them, they both indicate that both of these populations are in decline, roughly by 20.9% and 26% collectively. So given that both of these populations are expected to decline over the short term, it's important to look further and how we can assess the stability of these populations over the long term. So in order to look at the stability and apply further analysis to learn about the demographic processes of what's happening in the system, we can look at what is known as the stable size distribution and the reproductive values, which is our left and our right eigenvectors of our large population matrix. So particularly useful is our stable size distribution. And this consists of the proportion of individuals in the population that remain constant in the size classes for the population to exhibit stable dynamics. And it's essentially when the population is at equilibrium. So mathematically, the stable size distribution and the rate at which the population is approaching equilibrium is known as the damping ratio. And the damping ratio mathematically is defined as the absolute value of our short-term population growth rate, lambda 1, divided by our long-term population growth rate, lambda. And as a rule of thumb, if a population has a damping ratio equal to 1, then we know the population is expected to be at equilibrium. If they have a damping ratio left than 1, then we know that it's moved away from equilibrium. <laughs> As we apply this to our po populations, we can see that the population experiencing less harvest pressure has a greater damping ratio than the population experiencing increased harvest pressure, although both populations are moved away from equilibrium. Now, given that both of these populations are expected to decline over the short term and they're both away from equilibrium, it's important to consider what management targets can be used in order to successfully manage these populations in response to harvest. So from there, we can perform elasticity analysis, which is an extremely useful tool and has gained popularity in population ecology at looking at how we can look forward in time at proportional changes in vital rates and how they have an proportional, a proportional effect on lambda, our population growth rate. So to estimate elasticity analysis, we do this Using, our IPM follow, using the following equation, where we see now our left, eigen, left eigenvector, which is our reproductive value, our right eigenvector, which is our stable size distribution of lambda, k is our kernel, z1 of z2 is our vital rates. And by doing so, we can estimate the elasticity analysis where lambda has a, an ultimate, um, what is that called? It's a function of vital rates, and this functionality is dependent on the life history of the species. So elasticity values with a higher value will have a greater effect on lambda over the long term. 
So we use this and we can, we can plot an elasticity matrix essentially. And this is, a, this is partitioned to various domains that include vital rate functions, including growth, survival, and fertility. So when we look at this, we have our population experiencing less harvest pressure. And along the diagonal here represents survival. Above that diagonal here and to the left, we have the contribution of sexually reproducing individuals. Below the diagonal and to the, or actually that's the right, below the diagonal to the left is actually the contribution of growth and vegetatively reproducing individuals. And when we look here for this population, we can see that survival of larger size class individuals contributed most to the population growth rate over the long term. So what that means is for management targets, they can focus on the persistence of these larger size classes, which will have a greater proportional effect on the population growth rate over the long term. Now, in applying this to our population experiencing increased harvest pressure, it holds a similar trend where we see the relative contribution of greater size classes in the population contributing to the overall long-term population growth rate, again, indicating that these are great management targets. Now, given that these high elasticity values indicate that you know, these larger size classes are of greater relative importance over the long term, both of these populations are away from equilibrium. They're constantly in flux, but yet they have significant differences between their short-term and population growth rate. It's important to consider how we can estimate this variation in the population growth rate and understand what factors are responsible for this variation. So, thankfully, we have another wonderful analysis and awesome equation to look at again, uh, known as life table response experiments. Now, in contrast to elasticity analysis, which looks in the, to the future in time and at the proportional contribution of vital rates on the population growth rate, we have a retrospective analysis where we can look backward in time and we look at the observed variation in vital rates and the differences of these variations and how this affected the variation in lambda. We can also use this to compare the variation of the population growth rates between our treatments. So our population experiencing greater harvesting intensity and less harvesting intensity. Now when we conduct this analysis, it's important to consider that we have to ultimately designate one treatment, so the population experiencing less harvest pressure or increased harvest pressure as a control or a treatment with, so that positive contributions of these vital rate functions will ultimately contribute to a positive um, values that contribute to the long-term population growth rate of the observed uh, treatment. So for our study, we designated our treatment experiencing less harvest pressure as our control because we were interested in learning about what factors contributed to the reduction in overall population growth rate that led to the population that was in decline. So our treatment here would be the ultimate population that's experiencing greater harvest pressure. So to estimate elasticity analysis, we have the difference between lambda for our, our, our matrices that are generated from our numerical integration between our treatment and our control. We have the kernel elements from our treatment which is, and control, and the sensitivity of our population growth rate to the mean kernel element, all evaluated by our midway kernel. Now, in a similar fashion, we can plot this similar to a population matrix generated from our elasticity analysis, except this time we're looking retrospectively in time, backwards in time, to look at this observed variation where we see over the long term, this population is still in decline by 1.3%, and then over the short term, it's in decline by 24% over the year. So what we see here is this contribution of survival of larger size classes, but because it has a negative value here, and because we have our designated treatment as our um, less harvested um, population, this means that this had a significant negative contribution to the survival of individuals in the population experiencing increased harvest pressure, which means that there was a greater probability of survival of these larger size classes in the population experiencing less harvest pressure. So that is harvesting by increasing the mortality of these larger size classes contributed most to this reduction in our overall population growth rate retrospectively by 24%, which is quite significantly over the short term. Now conversely, we see this positive contribution 
of, of um, um, smaller size class individuals, including uh, vegetatively reproducing individuals contributing to lambda, but not enough to offset this negative contribution of larger size classes, which is ultimately why these population, this population experiencing increased harvest pressure is in decline. Okay, you ready for a break from the math? <laughs> so, you know, I know this is complex, but this is important because we can really use this tool and these tools essentially, you know, combining ecology and integral calculus with local and indigenous community knowledge to really get a broader perspective on how we can approach ayahuasca sustainability. Now, obviously, we, we saw that, you know, this is a useful tool, that harvesting had a significant effect on the size-dependent survival rate of ayahuasca. We know that, you know, our population experiencing increased harvest pressure is in decline over the long term, and a population that was experiencing less harvest pressure is, you know, expected to grow over the long term, and both populations are expected to decline in the short term. Looking at the stability of the populations, we know they're both moved away from equilibrium. And over the long term, elasticity values of larger size classes were great management targets because they contributed most favorably to the proportional contribution of those size classes to fitness, to lambda. We also see that our looking back in time, retrospectively, that the greatest differences in our overall population growth rates were primarily due to the survival growth of larger size class individuals and also the relative contributions of these smaller size classes, including vegetative reproduction. Now, while this was informative, this really was a short-term study, and there's much more rigorous ways that we can approach this kind of population modeling. You know, we use a deterministic model through this IPM, but we can also use stochastic sequences to model variation and environmental factors as well. And this could be useful given that we know that ayahuasca populations grow in various environments, you know, throughout the Amazon and other parts of the world. So future studies, including long-term studies on the variation and how we can measure this will be informative on how we can approach sustainability. It also is important that we look at extensive studies on the reproductive ecology of ayahuasca and Dibleteris cabarana because they're in the same family. And essentially, you know, it may be the case that there is a trade-off between sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction in response to harvest. And this is important to consider because, you know, it's well known that ayahuasca can be vegetatively propagated fairly easily. It's, it's, you know, it's been expected that maybe this is due to a large native range in the Amazon due to the aid of Amerindian societies where it can be easily transported through trade routes and migration patterns. And it's a question whether growers and harvesters today are primarily relying on clonal reproducing individuals to propagate or they're propagating from seed. Now this is important because over the long term, we may, re, um, ayahuasca populations that are primarily clonally based may ultimately experience a reduction in fitness due to loss of heterozygosity at certain alleles over time. <laughs> this is not always the case, right? Because nature can find a way and sometimes we have mutations in clonally reproducing species that allow for fitness and gene flow. And in some clonal reproducing species, they can be fairly genetically diverse, even comparable to sexually reproducing species. But we do not know whether or not this is the case for ayahuasca. And therefore, it's important to look at that uh, and the genetic diversity of these species. Now, to further this, we need to value and thoroughly understand the local and indigenous communities' knowledge and how they are managing these plants from a local perspective and gain understandings on their perspective of sustainability. Now, several images here I'll present from our study to highlight some considerations. We know ecologically under certain conditions, ayahuasca will produce incredible root structures that may allow it to be competitively superior in its environment. This may be informative on how we can ultimately maximize growth and production. So future studies looking at optimal conditions at various ecoregions will allow for a greater understanding on how we can promote greater growth and greater production. This is also an image of one of six harvested trees that were harvested to cut a single ayahuasca vine in one of our sites. Now, as a growth form, we know that ayahuasca or lianas in general can respond favorably to increased light availability. 
But we also know that ayahuasca can be selective for certain host trees. And further studies on host tree compatibility will further under, um, expand our understanding of whether harvesting practices like these negatively or positively alter ecosystem dynamics and which are most favorable to ayahuasca production. In this image, we see a very small size, a small class size vine that's harvested to produce ayahuasca and was replanted at the base to try to uh, promote vegetative reproduction. Now, what's interesting here is we see in many cases in these populations that smaller size classes are being cut, which may be an indicator that these larger size classes are getting more challenging to find. But including this, we have to consider the quality of the brew that's made from harvesting such small size classes and how this may affect the, the overall um, population dynamics over the long term. In our, in our last image here, we see one of the vines that have been cut. We see that this regeneration of new shoots that come up from a common root system. Now, it'll be important to consider the regeneration time that it needs for ayahuasca to reach maturity to be able to be harvested again and to compare this between new seedlings and clonal reproducing individuals to see which conditions are most favorable for increased production because we're going to have increased globalization continue and increased pressures as it continues to expand its dialogue with humanity. Now in closing, I want to highlight a schematic diagram that highlights some of the potential ways that we can approach ayahuasca sustainability uh, within four domains of consideration, including ecological, economic, social, and cultural perspectives. Now some of the key um, stakeholders are mentioned here, although this is not exhaustive. My intention here is really to spark the catalyst of thought on how we can begin this dialogue among stakeholders so that we can collectively work together to approach sustainable use of ayahuasca and sustainable production informed by integral projection modeling and local people and indigenous community knowledge. Now, within this ecological domain, it's important to consider whether current production locally and commercially supports ecological sustainability. It's important, as we discussed, to study the genetic diversity and whether there are botanical substitutes that are used in lieu of what we know as Benisteriopsis as one species and how this may affect the population dynamics over the long term. It'll also be important that we ensure that cultivation increases also with the protection of ancestral lands so that we can make sure that these species are around for future generations. Other incentives to consider in the economic spectrum is whether or not we can use sustainably sourced product in such a way that we can have incentives for all stakeholders involved to make sure that we approach this with sustainability in mind. It's important to consider how we can approach this to develop a fair market price for all stakeholders involved, including reasonable and living wages for growers, harvesters, and producers, and other stakeholders that may overlap. It's important to consider how we can develop commercial profit sharing for indigenous peoples and local communities who undoubtedly have a stake at this sustainable production and ancestral lands. Now, from the cultural perspectives, it's important to consider how sustainable production may affirm and support biocultural heritage and resilience, and whether marketing sustainable source product can become a strength of a source of strength for indigenous peoples and local communities and other stakeholders like the churches as well and whether commercialization is culturally acceptable, industrial or locally, on the scale that we are looking at today. It'll be interesting, and I hope that we can approach this in such a way that sustainability can power indigenous peoples and local communities. And we need to do this in such a way that we can address our concerns globally and see how we can support collective collaborations across all stakeholders. How do we approach this? This is a huge question to ensure that every stakeholder pr promotes sustainability and does it in such a responsible way. You know, one thought I have is whether sustainability can support social cohesion among all stakeholders involved, knowing that the importance of ayahuasca to all of the communities and all the ways of beings in which it relies. And finally, it'll be critically important that we develop sustainable education programs so that we, we can have education for all stakeholders involved so that we can ensure that this dialogue between ayahuasca and humanity and non-human entities and beings 
can remain and continue this dialogue. Thank you. Take a few questions here. Monica. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, amazing. Uh, it reminded me of when I was a marine scientist. <laughs> all of those equations, and we use them for fisheries. And uh, what happened to our fisheries? Yeah. They were beautiful equations. Yeah. But there is one missing thing in those beautiful equations, which were missing already in my equation, and they're still missing now, and exactly. it's the most important bit of information. <laughs> exactly. Where is the human? And yeah. really, beyond that, which speaks to your final graph, which is beautiful and heartwarming. <laughs> Thank you. But where is the human in the human that can really appreciate the equation that you're presenting? Because in fishery, all of those population collapsed. Yeah. And they were all harvested, uh, what we know as recruitment overfishing. Of yeah. course, you take the big ones and then you start going down the scale of sizes. And so it's not like your data fits exactly what we would normally do with any resource. Right. So that's again, there is a problem because, and I remember Robin Wolkimera mentioning this, so I'm going to borrow her words. And she said, if we speak of uh, sustainability, it means that we are already not understanding what reciprocity is. Exactly. So now the question is, for example, the pressure that is coming is actually coming from our world. Yes. Because so many of us, and I'm including all of us, are either uh, the neo shaman that I'm gonna do all of these retreats and I'm gonna charge shit lots of money so that everyone can pay. And this is my way of living. I'm in service. Yeah. yeah. In service to what? Exactly. Would so you sell your grandma because this is your grandma? Exactly. And it is your family. It is your friends. It is our entire existence at stake. So the question I think for you is, is sustainability actually the question? You're, that's a really good question. It is our relationship with the plants. And I agree, you know, I agree. Um, that's an important dialogue to open up for everybody to look in the mirror and address that. I mean, this is important that we acknowledge our relationship and, and develop ways in we can approach reconciliation. You know, reconciliation with nature and how we, you know, how we interact, whether it's purely extractive or we develop these relations out of reciprocity. Um, that's an important thing for all of us to look at. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about psychedelics and ayahuasca in itself is because in, in many cases, I can only speak for myself. It opens me up to that possibility. And, you know, from a reductionist scientist perspective, they, I would not be allowed to say it in my dissertation defense, although Mark may object, that, I, that plants have human agency. But from a personal perspective, I acknowledge the possibility, you know, and I respect that. And so I think this is important for all of us to consider. You know, this may not be the only way to address this, but I think it's one tool that we can use to begin that discussion. And, and of course, we need to incorporate the indigenous perspectives of sustainability. What does sustainability mean? to local peoples and indigenous communities, and being that they are the stakeholders, and a lot of the over-exploitation is due to this commercialization and globalization, we have a lot to come to reason with. So I'm hopeful that we can at least begin these discussions, and this is very important, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just saying that in fishery, the, one of the ways in which that was resolved after so many models was no take zones. Yeah, exactly. You remove the, the very cause that is creating yeah. even the need for an equation of this yeah. kind. Yeah, and I, I think that's one of the important things, you know, I think even Eduardo Luna had mentioned a long time ago, I remember listening as a really young kid, barely into ethnobotany at all, that, you know, if we knew the economic value of ayahuasca, for example, in such a way that you know, instead of deforesting the, the Amazon for, you know, soya bean farm, cattle ranching, so on and so forth, and mining, what if we planted more ayahuasca? What if we, and we protected the lands in such a way that it could be around? I don't know if it's the answer, but I think at least protecting some ancestral lands and protecting the species will be important. 
So. Michael, do you? Yeah. Yes, this may be a naive question, but do you have any thoughts in terms of uh, carbon sequestration and the botany of large lianas compared to similar sequestration dynamics with large? I don't know the numbers, <laughs> but I, I know it, I, I predict that it would be rather significant, but I, I don't know the numbers. I cannot speak to that. So potentially this deforested land could be regenerated with lianas. Exactly. Their growth could be protected. Yeah, they're, they're long-lived species, and you know, I, they're very prolific, you know, given a chance, so it's possible. Yeah, Michael, thank you. Um, but I, I couldn't help thinking the entire time that you were talking that there's an elephant in the closet here, and the, that at the same time that you're doing all this research, and I understand you're wanting to protect this plant, and, and moreover, the people who are also there, the elephant is climate change and, mm. that, and the deforestation of the yeah. Amazon. And it's predicted that in, in as little as 20 years, years yeah. we're going to start the savanna. Mm -hmm. the, the Amazon is going to turn into a savanna that's going to kill the rest of the planet. Yeah. So that I, I find it hard to hear this and yeah. not have that in the equation. Yeah, thank because, you. Yeah. Oh, go okay. ahead. Thank you so no, much no, for bringing fine. that into the discussion. I, I agree that... It's not just the overexploitation or the increased harvest pressure of these species. We have so many moving pieces. You know, we have the deforestation at a, such an alarming rate. You know, all the factors that are playing a role in addition to these increased harvest pressures. So we're losing these native or potentially native ranges for these plants. And this is an incredible pressure on, on, on the lungs of the planet, as we know. And not to mention, you know, the cultural webs of life, the biological webs of life that are responsible for so much, so much of the richness of humanity, of the planet. And so there's so much at stake. You know, I, I hope that, you know, one of the great things I, I think, you know, iOS can teach is that, you know, that our destructive path may not be the best approach, you know. And... I'm hopeful that we can that we can come to reason with this. This is our probably our best chance at not only allowing these species, but really our own survival. Because we will not make it if we lose the Amazon. At least that's my prediction. So, thank you, thank you very much. Do you know the extent of occurrence of of the liana? So the area in which it grows, and have you looked at some of the existing? conservation tools that can use those data to to get effective protection in place? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we don't know the exact native range due to the spread of migration patterns. I mean, it's widespread throughout the Amazon, so we don't even know how many of these plants remain in the wild. Um, in terms of, like, you know, getting an estimate of that, there would have to be teams of, you but, know, but given given yeah. that large extent of occurrence yeah. and the clonal nature of the plant, yeah. wouldn't cloning be the solution to sustainability in a in a smaller lo localized um, use? You know, tr tradition it, tradition of, of it may be useful, but then again, it may it may come at the cost of you know genetic diversity and large, fitness. I mean, it just depends. You know, I mean. I cannot say that, okay, the solution would be for, you know, to clonally produce it all over the population, all over the, the Amazon. We still need the, the sexual reproduction for diversity. Um, but, you know, I think one approach would be to encourage growth, you know, and, 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 and cultivation, if you will, amongst the stakeholders involved, you know, people that have centers. I mean, if you're, if you're going to make the, the money and have this, um, this, you know, for better or worse business, if you want to call it that way, then it, there, you know, a good approach to have a little bit of reciprocity would be to ensure that you have enough growing to where you can provide for your center and not contribute to increasing pressures in other areas. I mean, this could, I mean, I don't know how we could approach this. It may limit how and what centers could provide how much ayahuasca because if they only have so much, you know, growing room um, but I think this is one way we can we can uh, begin to address that. Go ahead. Got one right over here. 
a practical related question is, does your model is already applicable to calculate per hectare how many trees, how many vines, how, uh, after how many years you can harvest to become really self-sustainable and that way become a metrics for regeneration projects in local communities? Yeah, well, if we if say, for example, we knew of existing populations, we can apply at least a population model to see, okay, at the current rate of harvest or the current intensity, what is happening in the system? Are we are we doing it in a sustainable way? You know, and then what what could, what size classes could we manage for potentially? But again, these these models are really, you know, we cannot look into the future fifty years into the future with these because so much is you know, in flux, right? It's good to look at a snapshot in time, you know, at the current state of when you census these populations. This is when they're most accurate, right? Um, but again, there's always flux, you know, because everything's in flux with, you know, the environment and, uh, you know, everything. So with all of these, you know, outcomes, it's good to interpret with caution and approach this in such a way that this is our best tools that we have right now but there's always something that can come from it that we can improve. I think we had one more question over here, and I think we'll oops, excuse me, and be ready for a little break. Yeah, I have two related questions. Um, first, is the harvesting that you're seeing being done by the Shipibo community? OK, that's a good question. So actually, yes and no. From what I know from the local people is that there's been some illegal harvesting, some encroaching on lands. So this is where it becomes challenging because, you know, a given community may not have a team to stay in the jungle to make sure that nobody's coming onto their land and illegally harvesting. This is one of the challenges that we are seeing is that, you know, vines are being taken from other people. This is why, for example, I didn't say the exact location and the GPS coordinates and all of this kind of thing because, you know, this is a this is a challenging thing. You know, I mean, even trying to get access to populations is challenging because growers and harvesters don't always want to reveal where their ayahuasca is growing because of this this potential betrayal that people have have experienced. And so the second question is, how do the Shipibo themselves see this question of harvest and the subjective relationship with the plants. Uh, I mean, I ask this because uh, the, the Machigingo I work with, they only use cultivated ayahuasca. Yeah. Not because of sustainability, but because the cultivated varieties they use, you can break with your hands. Oh. And they, they, don't, they say you shouldn't cut ayahuasca with a machete because it's, it, it harms the plant, and so you only break it with your hands. So all the varieties they use, they, they're, they're, they break with their hands, and the ones in the woods, you can't break with their hands. Yeah. So what, how do the Shipibo see that From, from what I've seen, they are very fond of the machete. <laughs> but, but, that, that, but that's not to say that all of the Shipibo are that way, but just within the communities I've worked with, I, I've definitely seen the machete. Um, but, you know, that's something to also to be further studied. You know, again, you know, even looking at the different varieties, for example, that, that, are, that are used, you know, botanically we still only understand them as a single species. You know, the question is, are there other actual, you know, lianas that possess these beta carbolines you know, that are being used actively that we are undiscovered to from the botanical view? You know, what, what would this mean for the harvest pressure of these species and, and how would this affect the system is it, still unclear. It, tomorrow, uh, I don't know it with the Dale Milaris listening to this talk, but tomorrow we are going to address a little bit of, of the ayahuasca cultivation. Uh, Wonderful. Uh, because we have 20 years now of experience, and especially uh, we found a possible way of vertical uh, cultivation of ayahuasca together with a fast growing tree, which ah, could companion. be. Yes, exactly. So, which could be uh, perhaps implemented in other areas with huge production Wonderful. and very good for uh, agroforestry as well because of the biomass produce, produced both by the ayahuasca vine and the companion tree. Wonderful. So we are going to mention that tomorrow. Okay? I'm, I'm looking forward to it with enthusiasm. Thank you, Eduardo. I think we have time for one more. If anybody else has any questions or... 
I don't know Again, if I have a simple answer. Being a simple person, I'll ask a simple question. Hardly, hardly. Do, do you think that the ayahuasca churches are providing a model for sustainability? Because I know they're their ethic is to uh, cultivate what they use, you know, and not to I've, the I've market. heard that, and I've heard they can provide uh, estimated, what, for 40,000 people per month, potentially, but I don't know, you is, know. Is this being done? It's hard to That's say. That's the question. Is, is it being done? It's hard to say. I mean, are they purely relying on what's on their lands and not going elsewhere? I don't know, you yeah. know. That's I mean, a, it seems that the business community, the retreat, business economies yeah. could benefit if they would of course if, if we if we come up with a model to ensure sustainable production and harvest this could be uh, awesome yeah. yeah thank you so much Michael. yeah thank you, thank you.